Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the next video in our series, going through a subject that Ellen White said is everything to us as a people. And she also made another really interesting statement, more than just interesting, very important statement about this subject. She said that false theories of this subject followed to their logical conclusion, sweep away the whole Christian economy. So needless to say, that's uh, a very important subject to rightly understand. And so what we're doing in this series is we're going through um, what early SDAs meant by the word person in relation to God, because the subject Ellen White was talking about is known as the personality of God. Okay. And in order to understand what early SDAs um, had to say about the personality of God, we need to understand what they meant by the word person. How did they use the word person and its variants? So in this video, we're going to be looking at uh, several things from Ella White and an article by George Amidon in relation to this important topic. Now, as we've covered in previous videos, um, we're examining statements from the pioneers and we're asking the question, what did early SDAs mean by saying things like God is a person, God is a personage, God has a personality, God is a personal being, etc." Now, I don't know if you've ever stopped to consider what it means to be a person. Um, but if you've never stopped to consider what does it mean to be a person, I'd like to ask for you to do that now. Think about what does it mean to be a person? And because that's what the early SCAs did. That's what they really were studying and examining in relation to the personality of God. And their teachings reflect this, um, this focus in their writings on personhood. So that's what personality of God refers to. It refers to God's personhood, not like character traits or that sort of thing. Um, it's not entirely devoid of discussing character traits, but the word personality and person, personage, um, those are all referring to the same sort of thing. But what did early SDAs mean by saying God is a person? We need to understand that in order to understand what they meant by saying God is a person. Now, the reason this is so important is because Ellen White identified the personality of God as a pillar doctrine of our faith. As SDAs, this is one of our pillar doctrines. And she said that if a pin or a pillar of our faith is ever being threatened, that the pioneers should speak out against it. She, of course, made this statement in 1905 when some of the older pioneers were still alive and she called for them to speak plainly about the doctrine and to let those who were dead speak also um, by reprinting of their articles. And when you compare the present day teachings within Seventh-day Adventist Church on God's personality and what it means for him to be a person, if you compare that to what the early SDA pioneers, including Ellen White, what they taught about what it means for God to be a person, you'll be pretty shocked to see the wide difference. I like total contrast between those two teachings, the pillar teachings and the modern teachings. Now that's not to try to be critical of anyone within the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. I'm just wanting to follow Ellen White's advice here, where she said, if these pillars are being threatened, that we should speak um, out plainly about what the true pillars of our faith are. So unfortunately, it's not just being threatened, it's already been removed, but we can work to, um, restore these pillars. And so I'd like to ask for you to pay close attention to the contents of the video and the entire series, because there's a whole lot here and it's important to get the full picture. So we're just seeing a little snippet right now, but let's briefly take note of what she says here. She says, those who try to bring in theories that would remove the pillars of our faith concerning the sanctuary, or concerning the personality of God or of Christ are working as blind men. 
when men come in who would move one pin or pillar from the foundation which God has established by his Holy Spirit, let the aged men who were pioneers in our work speak plainly, and let those who are dead speak also by reprinting of their articles in our periodicals. So in 1905, when Ellen White made this statement, um, some, like I said, some of the aged men who were pioneers in the work were still alive. Now, one of those men happens to be George Amidon, the person that we're going to be looking at um, one of his articles today. He was one of those aged pioneers, and we have reason to believe that he rightly understood this pillar doctrine. Now, just to kind of share a little bit of um, historical information about George Amidon, this is an excerpt from a general conference bulletin in 1909. It was the last general conference that George Amidon attended, as well as Ellen White. It was the last one that they attended before they died. George Amidon died in 1913, and Ellen White died in 1915. So you see there in the blue, A.G. Daniels makes a statement. He says, Brother Amidon was one among the very first to accept this message. So he was very early on uh, in the movement, a uh, very early pioneer. In fact, um, J.N. Loughborough is the one who brought him in. J.N. Loughborough came in in 1852, and George Amidon came in in 1853. And George Amidon is also on uh, record here. Further down in the yellow under the blue G.W. Amidon, he says, I embraced the truth in the summer of 1853. And then he went to work at the Review and Herald office, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in showing that we have every reason to believe that George Amidon understood the truth about the personality of God, I want to share another statement from Ellen White. And the statement we're about to look at was made by her in a letter just two years earlier than the statement you see on the screen. This statement on the screen from Manuscript 62 was dated 1905. And two years earlier, she wrote to ministers and other workers in the Southern states and she mentions George Amidon in this letter to those workers. Now, keep in mind, in 1903, this is right in the heart of what has come to be known as the Kellogg crisis. And as we'll see, um, what she's saying here in this letter is directly related to that controversy or, or, or that crisis. So at the time this letter was written, the Review and Herald printing press in Michigan had already burned to the ground. And George Amidon, who had been working as a typesetter in the printing press for something like 50 years, he didn't just stop doing any of that work. He went to the Southern states to help with Edson White or help Edson White with um, the printing work and various labors in the Southern states. So he had been working as a typesetter since 1853. After the Review and Herald building burned down, he went to the Southern states. And in this letter, Ellen White says, I pray that our people may not fall victims to the snares that Satan has laid to entrap unwary souls. But even now many are bewildered. All need to be independent Bible students. I am writing words of warning that no one need be deceived by the enemy to lead others into crooked paths. I have carried a heavy burden because of the publication of Living Temple. I think that the Lord has permitted this matter to develop in order to arouse our people to understand and value aright the fundamental truths that, as a people, we have received from the Word of God. We must know that we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Our Father bids us call to mind the former days after which, when we were illumined, we endured a great fight of affliction. I have received most precious assurances that our early experiences were of God. I wish that every one of our people might know as I know of the sure and certain way in which the Lord has led us in times past. Brother Amidon knows something of our early experiences. 
I am sure that he remembers many of the straight places through which we passed. I am glad that Brother Amadon is now engaged in the Southern work. You may strengthen one another in the most holy faith. Each one is to stand in his lot and place. It causes me great sorrow of heart to see that there are among our workers those who do not realize the dangerous character of the doctrines that some are entertaining regarding God. I know how dangerous these sentiments are. Before I was 17 years old, I had to bear testimony against them before large companies. In New Hampshire, there were men who were active in disseminating false ideas regarding God. Light was given me that these men were making the truth of no effect by their ideas, some of which led to free loveism. I was shown that these men were seducing souls by presenting speculative theories regarding God. Okay, so now what can we learn from all of that? Well, let's go back to the first slide. And from this, we see that her statements are in the context of this crisis surrounding the publication of Living Temple. And we know from other things that the major problem with Kellogg's book, Living Temple, was that it taught spiritualistic theories regarding the personality of God. Okay. Now, the other thing we can learn from the statement is that this book was a snare that Satan laid to entrap unwary souls. And that when Ellen White wrote this letter, she said, even now, many are bewildered. Okay. So many SDAs were bewildered way back then. Another thing we can learn from this is that God permitted the um, events to develop in order to arouse the SDA people to understand and value aright the fundamental truths. So we learned that there were fundamental truths. In other words, not just something that was up for debate and expected to change over time, something that was received from the Word of God as a fundamental truth. They received it as a people. So we can also learn from this that we as a people need to make sure that we are understanding the fundamental truth that God gave to us as a people. Okay, so here's something else we can learn. Our Heavenly Father wants us to call to mind the former days, and that's part of what we're doing in this series. We're looking back at historical documents, articles that were printed by early SDA pioneers, looking at the original documents to see what did they teach, what did they write, what did they promote about the personality of God. And Ellen White says that our early experiences were of God. These are divinely revealed truths. They weren't mysteries. In fact, um, Ellen White's vision in February of 1845, so very, very early on, is where God showed her the truth about his personality. And uh, we don't have time to look into all of that here, but I've mentioned it a little bit in other videos, and I'm sure I will mention it again. So um, another thing that we can learn from this statement is while she made the statement that many were um, bewildered, many of the SDAs were bewildered about certain fundamental truths related to the publication of Living Temple, evidently Brother Amadon wasn't one of them because she says that he knows something of our early experience and she's sure that he remembers many of the straight places through which they had passed. And then she goes on to say that she's glad that he's there working in the Southern states with other ministers and other workers. Now, if she thought that he was one of those who was bewildered, she wouldn't be saying, I'm really glad he's there in this context, right? Now, all of this is to say that George Amadon is one of those early pioneers that Ellen White would have had in mind when she wrote what she did in Manuscript 62, 1905, when she said, when the pillars of our faith are being threatened, let the aged men who were pioneers in our work speak plainly 
and let those who are dead speak plainly by reprinting of their articles. So obviously he's not alive to be speaking for himself, but his writings, uh, we have his writings. And one of the main articles that he wrote that addresses the personality of God is the one that you see on the screen there. The title is Moral Image and Moral Likeness. Now we're going to look at this article to see how did he use the word person and its variants. But as you can see from the title, a lot of the article has to do also with the words image and likeness. Okay. Now, since Ellen White said that she was the one who gave to the brothers and sisters who met together early on in the days of the movement, um, when the pillars of our faith were being established, that it was given to her by divine revelation, and she gave to the brothers and sisters the revelation or the instruction that God had given her as to the position they were to take regarding truth and duty. I cover this more in more detail in other videos, so be sure and check those out. Now, an, an interesting thing about George Amidon, a relevant point for our discussion here today, is that in connection with his work um, at the Review and Herald Printing Press, he, he was the typesetter there for a long, long time. And in order to make sure he was typesetting accurately, he learned like six or seven additional languages, I think six additional languages to English so that he could make sure he was spelling things appropriately, cor correctly in the typesetting. So one of the languages he learned was Hebrew. And in this article, part of his approach, he's taking a slightly different approach than some of the other pioneers, because not all of the pioneers learned Hebrew, but he did. And so he was taking the approach uh, in part to show these words that are translated in English as image and likeness, the Hebrew words behind them have a particular meaning. And we're going to get to that. But since his article deals with image and likeness, and since Ellen White says that she passed on the knowledge or the information about God's personality to the pioneers, I'd like to start first with looking at how Ellen White used the terms image and likeness and what she had to say about mankind being made in the image and likeness of God and see how she used these terms. And then we'll look at George Amidon's article and compare it to what Ellen White had to say. Okay. So in the Spirit of Prophecy, volume four, page 463, Ellen White writes, in the beginning, man was created in the likeness of God, not only in character, but in form and feature. Now, before we continue, notice what she said there. Man was created in the likeness of God, not only in character. Now, this shows that character was a part of what it meant to be created in the likeness of God. But the fact that it's not only in character shows that there is something else right? And the something else, the other way that man was created in the likeness of God had to do with form and feature, okay? Now, form and feature is in contrast. It's in addition to character. So it's not character. It's something physical, form or feature. It's the physical resemblance, right? It's how we look. So we'll continue reading now from this point. She writes, sin defaced and almost obliterated the divine image, but Christ came to restore that which had been lost. Okay, now what was lost? Sin defaced and almost obliterated the divine image. So it's the divine image that had been lost, right? That's what Christ came to restore. And then notice what immediately follows that statement. She says, he will change our vile bodies and fashion them like unto his glorious body. Okay, now clearly part of the restoring of the divine image that mankind lost 
part of that restoration consists in restoring our physical bodies to the way we were intended to be, uh, how we were intended to look, how we were intended to be as far as you know, health and vitality and all of that. We need to be restored to the image that we had before sin defaced and almost obliterated the divine image that Christ came to restore that which had been lost, right? So that's one example of how Ellen White used the words image and likeness in regard to man being made in the image and likeness of God. Now, here's another statement um, where Ellen White uses the terms image and likeness. This is from another book. This is Education, page 20. And here's what she says created to be the image and glory of God, 1 Corinthians eleven seven, 7, Adam and Eve had received endowments not unworthy of their high destiny. Graceful and symmetrical in form, regular and beautiful in feature, their countenances glowing with the tint of health and the light of joy and hope, they bore in outward resemblance the likeness of their maker. Okay, and check this out. Nor was this likeness manifest in the physical nature only. Okay, now in other words, this likeness was in the physical nature, just not only in the physical nature, right? There was another way that man was made in the likeness of God. And then she goes on in the book to explain that um, man was also made in the likeness of God in regard to the ability to comprehend morality. So that was part of the likeness, part of the, um, the similarity to God's image, right? But in regard to outward forms, outward features. That's what she's referring to as being created in the image and likeness of God. But she says, nor was this likeness manifest in the physical nature only, okay? So it's really important to recognize that Ellen White is saying that physical resemblance is part of the likeness of God, okay? Now, with that in mind, um, let's look at one more statement from Ellen White before moving on to see what George Amidon had to say about the personality of God. Okay, this quote is also from the same book, Education. It's just further on in the book from what we had just read. She's already made the point on page 20 earlier in this book that mankind was made in the physical image and physical likeness of God. And then here on page 131, she says, God is a spirit, yet he is a personal being for man was made in his image. Okay, now we just saw what she had to say about what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God, right? And if you need to go back, you know, and, and look at the quotes again, please do. It's vital to understand these points. Now, one of the reasons why it's vital to understand these points, again, just a reminder, this statement on the screen at the bottom now that you see is a statement she made to John Harvey Kellogg, telling him that he was not clear on the personality of God, and the personality of God is everything to us as a people, right? Now, why is it that it's everything to us as a people? Well, one reason is because spiritualistic theories regarding the personality of God uh, followed to their logical conclusion, sweep away the whole Christian economy. I mentioned that earlier, but here's the statement where she actually says that. And how does it sweep away the whole Christian economy? Because spiritualistic sentiments are atheistic. Okay, we saw that in a lot more detail in the previous episode where I covered some statements by D.W. Hull, okay, H-U-L-L. -L. So, um, we saw a lot of that in that episode. I'll be sure and put a link to that previous episode in the description. In case you haven't seen that, I encourage you to check it out. 
Okay, now in that video that I just mentioned from Hull, the previous one, in that video, we also saw some statements from Ellen White that you see here where she overtly taught that for God to be a personal God means that he's tangible. He's physical, he's tangible, right? He's not something intangible. You see that there at the top statement. He was not an intangible spirit. He's a living ruler of the universe. He's not something intangible. The lower statement there says God is not something intangible, but a personal God. So you see that not being intangible and being a personal God shows that a personal God is tangible, right? He's a living ruler of the universe. Now, I'm out of room on this slide. I'm just going to plop something in on the top of the slide here over that heading. But this is the statement that we looked at just a moment ago from Education, page 131, where she says, God is a spirit, yet he is a personal being for man was made in his image. Now, if we compare these three statements that you see on the screen right now, we can see that Ellen White didn't think that being a spirit means that a spirit is intangible, right? It, being a spirit doesn't equate to being immaterial or intangible. Hopefully you can see that. And if you need to just pause the video and just, you know, read the statements, I encourage you to do this. This is very, very important. Remember, it's everything to us as a people. It's important to make sure that we're really understanding this. Okay. Now, Ellen White is saying that even though God is a spirit, being a spirit doesn't equate to the idea of being non-physical. And we can see that she isn't giving a spiritualistic portrayal of God. She's giving a physical portrayal of God, a tangible portrayal. And this is what Ellen White meant by using the term uh, personal being, right? So this is what God has revealed through his word and by divine revelation to Ellen White about his personhood or about his personality. And as we've seen in our previous episodes for this series, portraying God as intangible or um, immaterial is actually a spiritualistic portrayal of God, which is also equivalent to an atheistic portrayal of God. Now, I'll have a link to that playlist in the description. And also, um, there's another link that I'm going to put in the description that I, I want to be sure and bring to your attention. We have another YouTube channel called Are You Minding What Matters? And it's geared toward just reaching anyone regardless of their religious profession, right? And um, in this series, Before Spirit Was Spiritualistic, we go through a lot of evidence to show that the word spirit did not used to convey any kind of um, notion of non-physicality. That has just been something that has developed over the years. Um, today, most people use the word spirit to refer to something that they believe is non-physical, but that's not the way the word spirit used to be used. And it's not the way the word well, the words in Hebrew and, and Greek underlying the English translation with the word spirit, it's not the way those uh, words are used in the Bible. So that's a really important point to be aware of. And I encourage you to check out that series as well. Um, spiritualism is a really, really big deal. It's the means that Satan is using to try to deceive if possible, even the very elect of God. Okay, so moving on now, we'll take a look at this article by George Amidon, and we'll see what did this pioneer teach regarding the personality of God? What did he mean by saying God is a personal being? Okay, so we'll just start reading here from his article. He says, in the first chapter of Genesis, we have a statement that God made man in his own image after his own likeness. Okay, see chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. 
This account is often seized upon by our opponents as good proof that man has a deathless spirit or some immortal principle dwelling within. The argument with them is this. God is a being without body or parts. Man is made in his likeness and image. Therefore, man must be in the moral likeness and moral image of his creator. Then Abaddon goes on to say, there are many conclusive reasons which may be advanced against this species of argument. We might argue, so as SDAs, we might argue that Jesus Christ is in the form of God, Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, had flesh and bones. Man is in the image of Jesus Christ. Therefore, God is a personal being. Okay, now that's pretty clear. The argument he lays out for the conclusion God is a personal being consists exclusively of points related to physicality, right? Jesus is in the form of God. That's a physical, right? God has a form. Jesus is in the form of God, then God has a form. Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, had flesh and bones as another physical aspect. And man is in the image of Jesus Christ, Yep, Jesus is a human being, so man is in the image of Jesus Christ, right? He took his glorified humanity to heaven, to the heavenly courts. Ellen White talks about that. This is yet another description related to physicality. Therefore, so this is George Amidon's conclusion, therefore, God is a personal being. Okay, so we can see that George Amidon was using the phrase a personal being the same way Ellen White used that phrase. They both used the phrase to mean God is a physical, tangible being with a form, body, and all the rest. He's not something intangible, right? Ellen White stated that explicitly. He's not something intangible. In contrast, he's a personal being. So a personal being is a tangible being. God is a person. Okay. Now, by putting these two arguments side by side, it can really help to see things even more clearly. You just get to see their argument and then George Amidon and the early SDA's argument. And we see that with their argument, it kind of starts off with saying the opposite of what George Amidon concludes, okay? So you can see right there, they say God is a being without body or parts, but George Amidon concludes, based on all these pieces of evidence related to physicality, therefore God is a personal being. He's countering their argument. He's countering the claim that God is a being without body or parts. And by countering that claim, he asserts God is a personal being. So clearly, he's using the word personal, not to indicate intimacy or character traits. He's using the word personal to indicate a person, a body, a being with a body and parts. Okay, now then, here is actually um, the whole of his article. I cut it up into three parts digitally, of course. I, I have it there in three parts so that you can see the whole thing. It's a pretty short article. And even though I will have a link in the description to where you can go and read the whole thing in the original document, I thought it'd be nice to have it here so you could see it. Um, there on the left under the heading is the part that we've just covered, the part where he lays out the two arguments. Um, those who say God is a being without body and parts and the SDA argument, or at least the early SDA argument, that God is a personal being. He has a body and parts. So, um, yeah, be sure and look for the link in the description. 
Okay, now if you look on the left with those purple bursts, right after he lays out his argument that we just looked at for why God is a personal being as opposed to a being without a body and parts, okay, that's the part we just read. He says, even though the argument he gave for the SDA position, even though that is a, a good argument just on its own, it's quite satisfactory in itself to show that God is a personal being with a physical body and parts. He says, there's another way of showing this same thing. Another way of showing that God is a physical being with a body and parts. And that's the Bible use of the Hebrew words that are rendered image and likeness in English. So um, in Genesis, where it talks about the creation of mankind, it uses uh, the words Selem and Demuth. Okay, so he's got those two Hebrew words there, and he's um, going to explain how they're used throughout the Hebrew scriptures. Now, remember, George Amidon learned Hebrew so that he could accurately typeset for the articles printed in, well, he didn't just learn Hebrew, he learned several other languages as well, so that he could ac accurately typeset articles when um, printing for periodicals and books and so on. So he explains that the Hebrew word for image is selem, and the Hebrew word for likeness is demuth, okay? Then he lists a bunch of Bible verses that include these two Hebrew words and gives the popular English translation for each word, because they're not always translated with the exact same English word, even though it's the same Hebrew word. Translators have, for various reasons, used different words in different contexts. Okay. So if you look at the top where the arrow is pointing in the center, that shows the full strip of the article containing the Hebrew word selim. Okay. Now, as you can see, he lists passages from Genesis, Numbers, 1 Samuel, 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, Psalms, Ezekiel, Amos, and Daniel. And then there at the bottom in the red rank rectangle, he says something that makes it super obvious what he means by God is a personal being, if it wasn't already obvious enough, right? And here's that section made larger so it's easy to see. Now notice what he says. He says, it will be seen by the above that Selim in every instance but Daniel 3.19, except those in which it refers to man's being in the image of God, is applied to images made with hands and can have reference to nothing but the physical form. The reader may judge whether its use in Genesis 1 and 9 are exceptions. Now, when I read this, I had to really kind of study it to understand, like, what exactly is he saying here in every instance but Daniel 3.19, except those in which it refers to man's being in, in the image of God. So you can actually see Daniel 3.19 at the top, just above the paragraph where the number 19 is there. And it says, and the form of his visage was changed. Okay, that's Daniel 3.19. And what he's saying is in Daniel 3.19, that is talking about just the expression on a person's face. So the form of, that's the word in Hebrew that um, is selim. Okay, the form of his visage was changed. While it's not talking about an image made with hands, it's not talking about an idol or carving or anything like that. In that usage, that Hebrew word is talking about the expression on someone's face. And then he goes on to say, now, in all these other instances, except in Genesis, where it's talking about man being made in the image of God, in all the other instances besides Genesis 1 and 9 and Daniel 3 19, it's talking about carved images like idols. So that's basically what he's saying here. He's saying that in all these above texts, the Hebrew word in every instance but Daniel 3 19, except those in which it refers to man's being in the image of God, is applied to images made with hands and can have reference to nothing but the physical form. He's saying that everyone would agree with that, that all of these other passages, everyone agrees that they're images made with hands and can 
um, refer to nothing but the physical form. So he's saying, look, all these other places, this Hebrew word means a physical form. I'll let the reader judge whether it's used in Genesis 1 and 9 are exceptions to, to that physicality, right? That reference to physical form. So obviously he has already stated his argument very clearly that God has a physical form and that's what it means to be made in the image of God. And he's calling the readers to hold to um, a level of consistency where he's saying there's no justified reason for making an exception for its usage in Genesis 1 and 9, saying that here when it says man was made in the image of God, that it doesn't refer to physicality, it refers to morality, you know, only that God doesn't have a body and parts. So he's saying, hey, you know what, here's all the evidence. I'll leave it to the reader to judge whether its use in Genesis 1 and 9 are exceptions. Now, clearly, the implication there is what's well, not even really an implication, but he doesn't think it's an exception. He is asserting that it also refers to physical form, that Hebrew word. Okay. Now, again, the image and likeness of God is not restricted to physical form, but it definitely includes physical form according to the early SDA pillar doctrine that Ellen White passed on to the pioneers from what God showed her in, uh, in vision. And again, that vision is from February uh, 1845. Okay, so we've seen George Amidon's use of the word personal in the phrase personal being. Uh, we've seen how he uses the word person to refer to God's personality. Now, the next time when we come back to go through more of the pioneers, we're going to be looking at Roswell F. Cottrell, and we're going to see um, what he means by saying God has a personal appearance. But I want to give you a little sneak peek at some of what he says. And one of the reasons is because um, I wanted to point out that we have another video on this channel that if you watch it before you come back to see the video for Roswell Cottrell or R.F. Cottrell, his initials are used a lot to refer to him rather than his full name, Roswell. But if you watch this other video on our channel, it's called What is Materialism? The Forgotten Foundation of Adventism. And it just explains what materialism is. And it's really helpful to understand because most people uh, have never really heard of the term materialism. So you'll be able to find out exactly what we mean and what the early SDA pioneers meant by materialism. And it's a really good first video to watch um, prior to coming to some of the other um, presentations that we will have on this channel, going through early SDA pioneer writings about materialism and how it connects to this pillar SDA doctrine of the personality of God. Now, I'll put a link in the description to that video, What is Materialism? The Forgotten Foundation of Adventism. So I guess that's it for today. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do so and click the bell so that you'll receive notifications for all of our new uploads. And we look forward to seeing you back next time.